Hey everyone, welcome back to the Sports Psych Show. Thanks so much for joining me. Today, I'm excited to speak to Dr. Kimberly Wagner. Kimberly, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So good to have you on. You're a clinical psychologist. We haven't had many clinical psychologists on the Sports Psych Show, so I'm looking forward to discussing um, the differences between Sports Psych and Clinical Psych and and diving into your experiences in both worlds. But before we do that, uh, I'm curious, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so um, I went to graduate school to get a doctorate degree in clinical psychology. And while I was in my graduate program, they talk about that you have to pick a research topic because in order to graduate from the program, you have to complete a whole research project from beginning to end. And so at the time, I had attended a lecture from one of the professors at my school, and he himself was was a sports psychologist. And at the time, he was working with the NFL team, the San Diego Chargers. And so he was kind of talking about just an informal study that he had done where he was looking at the mental skills and the characteristics that enhance performance in NFL players. And so I thought, wow, that, that's a really interesting intersect. So I had been a competitive athlete my whole life, and I also had a, a passion for psychology. And I thought, you know what, that's kind of the perfect avenue for me to go down. And so luckily, this professor agreed to be the, the chair and the lead for my dissertation research. And so what we did is I just took his research study, but then I looked at it with Major League Baseball players because that was the population that I had access to at the time. So I interviewed Major League Baseball players. I asked them, you know, what are the mental skills and what are the characteristics that enhance performance in Major League Baseball players that kind of keep you around longer? Because the average career for a Major League Baseball player is two to three years. Um, And also what's unique about Major League Baseball is that there's three levels of minor league teams that you have to get through first before you even make it to the majors. So it's different from other sports. So I thought that kind of had an interesting aspect to it as well. And then from the interviews is how I collected my data and I was just looking for common themes. Um, So if the participants endorsed Um, a a skill or a characteristic frequently enough, um, then I could include that as saying, hey, this is statistically significant. And, And so that's how my research formed and how I got my results. And then from that, I kind of used that as a platform of how I was going to work with athletes in my private practice. And I uh, have been in private practice since 2011 and just worked with athletes from not only baseball, but all sports uh, since that time. Fantastic. Now, I'm keen to unpack that research paper and and talk about those mental skills. I take note that you said you were an athlete yourself. Did you compete in one sport or was it multiple sports? Yeah, so I competed in a couple of sports, but I had one sport that I really excelled in, and that was soccer or, as you guys say, football. (laughs) Okay. And, And was that just at high school? Was that at college? Yes, it was at the college level. Okay. Okay. And when you question, I always ask serious athletes or or people who have taken their athletics seriously is given what you know now and being able to get to go back in time in a a time machine, uh, would there have been anything that you would have incorporated into your play based on what you know now? Absolutely. There's a lot of things. Um, When I was a competitive athlete, I unfortunately wasn't even aware of the field of sports psychology. And so I think just having that awareness would have been significant. Um, And then just, again, a lot of things, which, you know, I'll get into later about, you know, mental skills and characteristics that enhance performance, which are so helpful and can literally change an athlete. So so would you say the mental side of the game, when you reflect back, was a strength of yours as a player or was it an area that really you reflect back and go, oh, I could have done a lot better there? 
I do think that even though I maybe didn't know what I was doing, it was a strength for me. But had I been taught more about it, it could have helped me even more. So your research dissertation, so that was part of your PhD? Yes, I had to complete a research project in order to be given a PhD. Really interesting. I mean, you said a couple of things that I didn't know. I, I, I didn't realize that baseball creates. I'm going to sound very English here and not au fait with uh, the world of baseball. Um, although it is a it, it is a sport that comes up frequently on the, on the sports psych show. But I did know, I, I know careers in the NFL tend to be short, but I didn't know careers in the MLB tend to be short. So I think it's going to be really interesting to unpack that idea of, well, what mental skills and characteristics help you stay around for longer, but um you interviewed baseball players and you were you were searching for what mental skills are important you were asking them what mental skills are important so can you unpack your results a little bit for us what what mental skills did did they speak about the most so being that this is the sport of baseball the number one thing that they talked about is the ability to be able to deal with failure and to be resilient because, you know, as we know, baseball is a sport of failure. So they say you get up to bat, you strike out seven out of 10 times, you can still be in the Baseball Hall of Fame. But it's the players that are able to figure out, OK, how can I be resilient and how can I deal with failure since it's so prevalent in this sport um, in order for me to be successful? So that was the first and most important skill that they talked about. Um, another one that they talked about a lot is the ability not only to have effective focus and concentration, but the ability to be able to go in and out of it because you're not always involved in the play in baseball. So, but you also can't be hyper focused the whole time because then you would just be exhausted by the end of the game. So it was really key for them to be able to get into a good focus when they needed it and to concentrate, but also when they didn't need to, when they're sitting on the bench or, you know, maybe they're not playing, that they can go out of it and relax. So going in and out of focus effectively was really important. Uh, another thing that they talked a lot about is the ability to manage stress. So a lot of players kind of called it the grind, right? Yeah. It's months and months and months of a daily grind. And there's a lot of things that are out of your control. Like, you know, if you get traded, you know, one day out of nowhere that you weren't expecting, being away from your family is hard, uh, even weather conditions, right? So they were just talking about you have to really have effective ways to manage stress, because if you can't manage that stress, you're not going to be able to play well. Uh, one of the things I talked a lot about as well is using positive self-talk. So I remember I one of my participants made a comment that every time that he would go up to bat, he would say to himself, I'm going to put a good swing on a good pitch. And so that just kind of put him in a positive mind frame and a positive mental state that would make it more likely that he would get a good hit. Um, another thing too, well, professional athletes have to deal with is the pressure of the sport. So a lot of the players talked about, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm on a global scale and I'm under a microscope, especially some of the bigger name players. And some of them kind of joked that, you know, we sometimes can affect people's lives for a couple of months while we're in season playing the sport. And so there's just a lot of pressure on us. We're in the media, you know, every single little thing that we do is going to be scrutinized. So if you can't figure out effective ways to manage the pressure of it being on a global scale and your life being completely scrutinized, again, that was something that would hurt your performance and probably would make it so you wouldn't have as long as a career. Um, they also talked about expectations. So a lot of times certain level of play and expectations would be put on a player, you know, you're the number one draft pick, they're going to expect that you're going to really be an additive to the team. And sometimes that pressure of these expectations being placed on them got to be too much for them. And so they would talk about, you know what, I, I can't try and live up to the expectations of what other people have for me. I have to set my own expectations and I have to try and live up to those. Because at the level that they're playing, they're going to have high expectations for themselves already. So that's really not a problem. 
but trying to live up to other people's expectations puts more pressure on them and that again can negatively affect performance. Um, and then the one other major theme that they talked about is learning. And so not only your ability to learn, but your willingness to learn. So not only can you learn, but are you open to learning? They said it's really important to not think that you know everything and not be open to getting feedback from people. So if you can learn and you're willing to learn, that will only help you. So it's, it, it seems like there were seven themes or skills that came through here. That feel, feels like the uh, title of your, your book, Seven Mental Skills for, uh, for Baseball Players, um, mm -hmm. evidenced informed as well. So just reflecting back what I've heard you say here, Kimberly, uh, dealing with failure and having a sense of resilience, uh, effective concentration and, and attention, especially being able to flex away from distractions. I heard managing stress, um, dealing with the grind, essentially, as you mentioned there, using self-talk, positive self-talk, uh, dealing with the pressure of the sport, highlighting things like the external world, the, the media, and so on and so forth, social media, managing expectations, um, and then and then learning, being willing to learn, and maybe being coachable. So seven mental skills. And was that a cluster that was specific to um, their responses around the most important mental skills? Or did that cluster move on to the, um, the skills required to keep you around for longer? In other words, were all seven relevant for both uh, sort of clusters? Yes, they were relevant for both. All right. So what I'm really keen to do here is sort of that's your research and, and, and we can put a pin in that or we can keep that with us as, as we speak about what, what you then have gone on to do with, uh, with your consultancy practice. So did these seven mental skills really form the foundation for your consultancy practice? They definitely did, um, as well as there were some other things that were mentioned in the dissertation research, but I couldn't include them as being a major theme. They were maybe more of a minor theme, um, as well as the uh, characteristics that they talked about, because they discussed some important characteristics as well. Please unpack those. What, what, what characteristics? So the number one thing that they talked about was work ethic. I remember one of the participants said, you got to be the first person at practice and you got to be the last person to leave. So really just having that internal drive and that motivation and the work ethic was really important. Uh, one of the other things that they talked about is having a good support system. So whether it's your friends or your family at home or maybe even your teammates or, or, or your manager, um, having a good support system really helped them to get through some, some tough times that they face as a professional athlete. Probably the most important one was self-confidence. So self-confidence is so integral to um, improving performance. Uh, I remember one of the participants said, too, it's not only about having confidence, but it's more coming from an internal place. So yeah, it's great if other people have confidence in you, but if you don't believe in yourself, then nobody else will. So not just being self-confident, but being self-confident from an internal place. Uh, they also talked about being able to maintain a positive attitude. So like I mentioned earlier, a lot of things are out of your control. And when things are out of our control from a psychological perspective, we don't like that, right? So that can cause us to have a negative attitude or be negative about that. If you can remain um, having a positive attitude, that really helps your performance. And then the last one they talked about, it's very popular sports psychology term. It encompasses quite a few things, but it's um, that concept of mental toughness. So just, again, the grind and being able to deal with all of these things that come along with being a professional athlete um, and just having enough mental toughness to, to manage that effectively. Uh, as a clinical psychologist, what does mental toughness mean to you? So uh, it includes a couple different things. One of it is being self-confidence, uh, you know, using positive self-talk, uh, again, having like stress management skills. So it, it really includes a lot of different things. But I think that 
uh, sports psychologists kind of use it to refer to um, many of the more specific uh, mental skills and characteristics. Okay, okay. So th- th- there's a relationship between the characteristics and the mental skills. That's what you're... That, th- that's what you're always thinking going into a consultancy uh, uh, moment with an athlete you're considering the relationship between these mental skills and the characteristics they go hand in hand yes all right and so uh, in your consultancy practice you know are, are there are, are there specific skills that you honed in on that you felt were the most important of the ones that they said they were really important Yeah, so probably the number one thing that I get uh, referrals for people that need to work on in my clinical practice is rebuilding self-confidence. So there's a lot of reasons why an athlete's self-confidence has decreased. So it's a question of figuring that out. Are they recovering from an injury? Are they in some kind of slump? Did they just move up to the next level of performance and maybe now they're not the best person on the team anymore? Um, So it's a question of figuring out what is it that contributed to the decrease in the confidence and then helping them to rebuild that confidence. And and how are you going about that by and large? And I, I suppose every individual is going to have their own specific challenges. But as a clinical psychologist, are you using psychological frameworks uh, to drive conversation? Or are you going straight into mental skills work? By and large, how do you go about building somebody's confidence? Yeah, so there's a couple of different ways that you can do that. One of the biggest and most helpful things that a person can do is the use of positive self-talk. A lot of times I'll say to someone, you know, when you're out there, when you're playing or when you're practicing, tell me what you're thinking. Tell me what your internal dialogue is. And a lot of times people will say to me, well, I'm not thinking really anything. And then I say to them, you know what, you probably are. You just aren't aware of it. So it's bringing awareness to what their self-talk is because most of the times it is negative in nature. So what I have them do is I have them write it down and then they bring it into the session with me and they discuss them with me. And then we kind of go through them one by one. We kind of pick up common themes. We kind of think about where is this coming from? Is this rational? Is this irrational? And then I have them write down a more positive, rational thought instead. And so then I just kind of have them repeat the positive, rational thoughts in their mind um, and eliminating those negative thoughts. Now, it is common that sometimes those negative thoughts are still going to creep in. So in the beginning phases of this process, it's really important that you pay attention to that. And as soon as you recognize those negative thoughts that start to creep back in, you immediately go back to the positive thoughts. Uh, So that's a really good way to help a person build self-confidence. Visualization can be a good way to help a person rebuild confidence. So getting them to visualize in their mind times when they've been successful, um, reminding them that a lot of sports just kind of have basic skill sets to them and they've been playing their sport for so long that they have the skill sets that they need. Um, And then also just helping them to eliminate any feelings of self-doubt that they may have as well, because self-doubt is another common thing that I see. And in terms of eliminating or turning down the volume of self-doubt, again, is that sort of utilizing self-talk, changing thoughts, shifting beliefs, that kind of process? Yes, it's very similar. And uh, with visualization, would you often go through a kind of a visualization script with somebody or have them go away and just practice visualization? Is there a sort of a process you tend to go through with, with, with players? Yeah, I'll do it with them right in the session when I'm with them because I do want them to get a sense of what it is that I'm asking them to do. Because one of the things that I ask them to do when they're Uh, doing a visualization is try to incorporate as many of your senses as you possibly can. So not only what does it look like, but maybe what does it smell like? Uh, Maybe what does it feel like? Uh, any, Any parts of their senses that they can incorporate into the visualization and really make it feel like they're there, the better. So making it as as sensorially rich as possible. Yes. 
And in terms of uh, types of visualization, I mean, would you get them to go through a game, a, a specific skill, um, a moment in time? Um, what would you get them specifically to visualize? Yeah, all of the above could work. Uh, definitely a moment in time that they've had success because oftentimes they can really remember what that felt like, right? And so getting them back to that moment and reminding them of like, hey, you've had success in the past and you can absolutely have success again. And, you know, in your consultancy practice, are you usually working one-to-one? Um, have you done much from a team perspective before? I have worked with some teams, but that has been much less than one-on-one uh, -on -one work that I do. What I like about one-on-one -on -one work is I really get to personalize it and individualize it to that specific athlete and what not only are their specific weaknesses, but what are their specific strengths, even in terms of mental skills, because there's you know many different mental skills that are out there and that athletes can try to use but not all of them work with all athletes. So it's really fun to try and figure out what ones are gonna work best for them and really just honing in on them and perfecting them for that individual person. And it's a, obviously we're talking a lot about skills here, mental skills specifically. Um, as a clinical psychologist, I assume you have athletes reaching out from a well-being and a mental health standpoint. I do, yes. So I will sometimes get referrals where the referring source thinks that there may be a clinical issue, but maybe that person doesn't want to go see a psychologist because of the negative connotation associated with that. But if you throw the word sport in front of it, somehow that actually makes it seem kind of cool, right? Um, so I will get referrals specifically because they want me to assess for a clinical concern, but the person is an athlete and we can work on that as well. Uh, with all of the athletes that I see, because I do have that training and background in clinical psychology, I definitely do assess for any clinical issues. Sometimes they are present. It might be depression, anxiety, an adjustment disorder, maybe an eating disorder, um, ADHD possibly. So I, I want to make sure that I'm assessing for any clinical issues that may be present as well, because if I don't, then I may be missing a big piece of the puzzle. And it's good that I can assess for both things, both kind of like the performance side of it, as well as the clinical side of it, to making sure that I'm not missing anything and I can really treat all aspects and not have to refer out to someone else that may just do mental skills or that may just do the clinical piece. And so you're straddling both worlds. Um, what would you say the big difference? I mean, for, for those listening in who aren't particularly well versed in this area, and they might think, well, a psychologist is a psychologist. If you consider clinical psychology and you consider sports psychology, um, for those listening in, what, what's the difference between the two? Uh, it's really, I think for me personally, it's about measuring the outcomes, right? So yeah, in my clinical practice, I have people fill out a brief symptom checklist at the beginning where, you know, they kind of rate their symptoms on a scale, how severe they are. And I do periodically uh, go through and have them fill that out again throughout the treatment to make sure that they, they are making progress in the skills that they, or I'm sorry, in the symptoms that they identified as being problematic. In sports psychology, I do the same thing if there are clinical symptoms present, but I can really tell if a person's improving uh, in their performance. And that's measured by stats, um, scores, playing time, right? All that kind of stuff. So for me, it's really interesting to be able to see that because sometimes in just kind of clinical psychology, you don't get as much of a stark uh, contrast in terms of from beginning to end of working with that person. But in sports psychology, uh, you really get to see that, which, which is kind of cool and it, and it's different. So there are, there could be considered to be slightly more, uh, objective measures in sports psychology. Exactly. And given that you straddle both worlds, where would you stand for instance, with respect to mental health and well-being and its relationship with performance are, are you are you a, a, 
are you a believer that um, great performance requires stable, positive well-being and positive mental health? And if if somebody is experiencing any kind of ill mental health or ill being, that performance will suffer irrespective of the mental skills they've got in place. Yeah, I mean, it may not be 100% of the time, but I would say more often than not, it does. You know, people kind of say, well, I can separate the two. I can separate my performance from what's going on outside of my sport. And what I found with athletes is you really can't do that. They both kind of bleed into each other. So, of course, you know, I'm an advocate if you're having any mental health issues, even if you're an athlete, um, you should get those addressed. Uh, There is also still a stigma, though, for athletes to seek mental health services because they don't want people to perceive them as being weak at all. Um, They may not want their coach or their manager to find out because they don't want them to think, oh, gosh, like, is that going to affect my playing time or am I going to lose my starting position on the team? So it, it can be a little bit, a little bit tricky. Um, But yes, I would say uh, I think it is very important to address any clinical psychology issues that may be going on, even irrespective of of your performance. I'm interested to understand, as again, as somebody who um, frequents both worlds, the tools, the techniques that you've uh, developed in your practice as a sports psychologist? Do those bleed into what you can offer people in your clinical practice away from sports? Yeah, so I think the the main way in which it's kind of led into other areas, and I can't even take credit for making this connection, um, I started getting calls of people wanting to work with me that were high-level professionals from all fields and all disciplines. And they said to me, hey, I have a job. I have a lot of pressure. It's a lot of stress. I need to perform at high levels consistently. Can you teach me what you teach your athletes? And I thought to myself, well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, of course I can. All of the skills that these professional athletes use absolutely translate over to academics or also people's careers or even sometimes parenting. I have a colleague that I work with um, that she says parenting is like the biggest performance of your life, right? <laughs> so so it definitely applies to a lot of different areas. For me, I think more specifically, it's kind of led me into more general performance coaching um, and doing executive and business coaching. So those seven skills, failure and resilience, effective concentration, managing stress, using self-talk, dealing with the pressure, obviously the skill with sport, but uh, dealing with the pressure of life and work, managing expectations and learning, those uh, uh, bleed into uh, a a corporate environment as well. Yeah, those and and some other ones as well. Uh, And so you've stepped into that world. And is that uh, uh, an easier challenge to help people in that world or is it completely different? There definitely is a difference, but I wouldn't say there's a big difference. There definitely are some differences. But what I have found, though, is that at least a lot of the um, business professionals that I work with, they were at one point in time playing a competitive sport, maybe not at the professional level, but to be a high level business professional in any discipline, you have to be competitive. You have to be motivated. You have to have a good work ethic. So these are all things that professional athletes um, possess as well. And so I, I know you've really dived into this area and you, 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 I mean, you have an online course, which we'll come on to, to talk about, but um, again, at, because your work in sport was shaped by your dissertation um, from these interviews, have you been able to extract from that and then you take that into the corporate world or is it a little bit more organic in the corporate world? No, I think it's just the same as you know how I approach it with sports and um, teaching them the skills and then having them practice the skills and then having them incorporate the skills in whatever the, the situation may be. So in your online course, I mean, tell us a little bit about your course. Talk us through that. Yeah, so it was actually at the suggestion of one of my clients that I 
do an online course because he had been reflecting to me how helpful he had found our work together. And he was saying, hey, you know, you got to make this available to more people because I can only see so many people a week, right? But he thought, wow, you know, if you can have this online course, then anybody can take it and then anybody can learn from you. And so uh, the name of the course is called Believe It, Achieve It. And the content for the course is based off of the research that I did with Major League Baseball players, and then as well as the clinical practice that I've had both with athletes and with business professionals uh, over the last 10 years. And so the, the course really is supposed to help you overcome barriers in your profession, a lot of them being mental barriers. Um, and helping you to achieve your goals professionally. So perform at your peak professionally. Give us an idea of what's inside the course. Uh, I assume it's video format. So you you talk about mental barriers. Uh, What kind of, uh, obviously we've spoken about mental skills. We've talked about characteristics. What kind of uh, mental barriers might people experience and, 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 and how are you breaking those barriers down? So there's a lot of different topics that are discussed in the course. Um, It's a series of short videos. It's asynchronous. You can do it on your own time. You can kind of click around and do the different videos. You don't necessarily have to go in order, but it discusses things like motivation or lack of motivation. Sometimes people are just really not feeling motivated, but that is really important for peak performance. Uh, Just like in sports, focus and concentration. Uh, Different things, again, that athletes do, which is setting goals, Um, how to improve your work ethic, increasing self-confidence, stress management. There's also different things in there about like being a good leader and leadership styles. Uh, I do include a couple of uh, bonus exercises in the course as well, which are also things that I do with athletes and um, that's mindfulness exercises as well as a visualization exercise which is what we discussed in detail previously you mentioned motivation again if i was to dive into the course what kind of what kind of advice do you have for people on motivation because this is such a hot topic people talk about this all the time motivation commitment uh feeling like you want to uh engage in a task or a discipline yeah tell us a little bit about motivation so for me how i approach most things with the people that i work with is yeah i can teach you skills about how to be more motivated which is great But I find it so valuable to find out, well, why are you lacking motivation? Because again, it could be a variety of things and it's different for different people. So then once we've identified why it is that you're lacking motivation, then I can kind of teach you the skills. But then I also need to figure out, okay, well, what's going to be motivating for you? Because again, what motivates people It's different for everybody. Some people are motivated by money. Some people are motivated by accolades. Some people are motivated by respect or a title, right? So it's like, why are you lacking motivation? What are the skills? And what it is that motivates you? Um, Sounds absolutely fascinating. And how can people find the course? So there's a couple of ways. It's on my website. So my general website is dr. And then my name, kimwagner.com. So there's a tab on there that you can click. Um, It has an online course. Uh, They can also get it on Instagram and Facebook. So it's under Dr. Kimberly Wagner. Um, And there is a free guide that you can access. And it's called The Five Secrets of High Achievers. And that's just kind of an introduction to my work. So you can get a sense of what I'm all about Um, There's a video on there. Um, So it really just kind of gives you an idea of what to expect from the course. Brilliant. Fantastic. And I don't want to let you leave without giving us a a couple more hints and tips. So uh, for those listening in, when one considers those skills that you've introduced us to, the characteristics that you've spoken about, what would be your top three tips for for? athletes listening in for those in in a corporate environment listening in? So probably number one, most importantly, would be self-confidence. If you aren't confident in yourself, it's going to be really hard to achieve your best. 
Um, I would also say motivation is one of the top ones. Again, if you're not motivated, you're not going to improve and you're not going to achieve at your best. And then I, probably the last one that I would say would be at the top of the list would be, again, dealing, dealing with failure and the ability to be able to be resilient because success is not a straight line, whether it's in sports or whether it's in the corporate world. You're going to have good times and you're going to have bad times. So it's a question of how do I be resilient and come back from the times that things don't go the way that I hoped they would and then keep moving forward. Sometimes people get stuck in the past, they dwell on the past, they can't move forward from that. And if you can't move forward and you can't deal with that, again, you're never going to be able to reach your peak performance. Fantastic. Kimberly, really, really interesting. And I, I know so many people listening in will be interested in reading more about your work and watching your course. Other than that, I, I think you mentioned your website, but how can people find you and follow you? Yeah, so on uh, Instagram, they can follow me, Dr. Kimberly Wagner. Uh, Facebook, same thing. My Facebook uh, profile is Dr. Kimberly Wagner. And uh, just one more time, my website is dr. K-I-M-W-A-G-N-E-R dot com. So drkimwagner.com. Um, there is uh, an opportunity for you to reach out to me directly if you would like to. I get people that reach out to me directly for various reasons, and it's always great connecting with people. Uh, and then also at the course, at the end of the course, if someone would like to do more individual work, there is an opportunity for them to follow up with me and work with me one-on-one. -on -one. Perfect. Kimberly, thank you so much for today. Thank you for having me. Well, everyone, I really enjoyed that podcast and I'd love to hear what you, the listener, think. So please do get in touch via X or Facebook or through my website, danabrahams.com, to tell me what you think of the show. And if you do have any suggestions, I'd be delighted to hear them. I'm already looking forward to next week's episode. Bye for now.